What I want to do in this video is to cover the section on the resort to the divine right of kings and cover the portion on James uh, the first. And, um, and here we see an interesting turn in the way that the feudal order is totally breaking down. Elizabeth has eliminated serfs illegally. She's separated England fairly successfully from the Roman Catholic Church. And so a lot of the feudal features are, are not uh, in place. And as I was mentioning before, it's like, well, from the perspective of the monarchy, if you are class conscious, which obviously the monarchy was class conscious uh, prior to Elizabeth, especially in terms of extracting money from the nobility, um, But they didn't think about how just eliminating feudalism eliminates the base, the, the, the conditions which make it possible for the monarchy to be the most powerful institution and class uh, in the society. And so <clears throat> uh, we wanna look at this. And and so what happens in the 17th century at the beginning is that James I and Charles I resort to this, um, this notion of the divine right of kings, which may have existed uh, prior to this, but it, but it would just be, you know, mumbo jumbo on top of the, and this is thinking from a Marxist perspective in terms of substructure versus superstructure. Remember that uh, in Marxism, we have this substructure is, is the, the realm of production that I went into detail about the different forms of production and how that, you know, allegedly at least evolved over time. And then things like art and religion and politics would be riding on top of this fundamental basis of production. And uh, in a similar way, you know, the feudal structure, uh, feudal vassalage and fiefdoms and, and that economy, that political economy, which did embody political relationships, but embodied it in real down to earth ways of structuring the way that human beings interacted with the ecology and produced products out of the ecology in order to keep people alive. Um, the politics was embodied in, in the form of production. <clears throat> now, the monarchy has altered the methods of production and made money much more important. Uh, but that's the very foundation on which the monarchy stands. And if you undermine the foundation, then you know the monarchy is going to topple. You would think, right? And and of course it is beginning to topple and we can see this in the politics uh, of James I and Charles I because they resort to this argument of the divine right of kings, which may have been okay, may have been something that people said prior to this, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't necessary, you know, didn't change anything because yeah, you have a divine right, but the reason why I obey you king is because you give me the fiefdom and I have a good, nice living, and I'm a big shot in my fiefdom. And then I give you, I give you, you know, your big. I give you your your cut, and everything's cool. If you want to say God made this possible, okay, I don't care. Fine. Just, I just, this is just a nice situation for me as a as a noble, for example. Um, <clears throat> I don't need some big story, but if you want to tell some story, that's fine. But what happens with James and Charles is they feel they they want to they want to 
make this story more important than the whole old relationship of the feudal order. Uh, and, and that doesn't fly. Okay. <clears throat> so James, uh, uh, comes onto the throne um, and let's see, I don't have it here, uh, but but uh, Elizabeth was the virgin queen because she never got married and she didn't have any children. And so James is related to Henry the eighth. And I want to say that he is her brother. Uh, Look it up here very quick. Yeah, let's see. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so he's not the, he's the son of Mary, who is the sister of Henry the Eighth which makes him the nephew. Uh, or, or maybe he's like the, I think he's the great grandson of Henry VIII, something like that. Oh, so Mary, uh, of Queen of Scots. This is not Mary who we talked about earlier. She was the great niece of King Henry the eighth. And then James is her son. So he's like a cousin once removed or something like that. But he's next in the line of succession after uh, at this stage in the game. Um, okay, so uh, since Elizabeth didn't have children and, and it, you know, the crown devolves to this extended family. So again, this, this idea of the, the line of succession as a whole class of people who are concerned about the power of the monarchy in relationship to the nobility uh, really comes into play here. You know, it can make people who might otherwise identify with the, the nobility um, be wanting to bolster the monarchy because they think their child or or themselves might become the monarch one day or something. Um, so James comes onto the throne. Uh, Richard Bancroft is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he issues these four 141 canons, and these are uh, a sort of reformulation of Anglican doctrine. And he wants everyone, all, all the, the bishops in particular, uh, but uh, higher up clergy to, and really everybody, and they, they did have systems of doing this, to make everybody swear an oath to these, these statements of theology or get out. And we have 300 ministers suspended and 80, uh, fully deprived uh, for nonconformity, meaning that they can no longer serve as clergy. So they're just unemployed clergy. Um, this uh, caused a revival of Puritanism. So you had uh, some people that are now considered Puritans, but had been getting by within the Elizabethan settlement and everything was hunky-dory. We have a new regime come in and they make it tougher for Puritans to, to blend in. And now you have uh, more religious division. And this is when the pilgrims were founded. Uh, a couple of the, the ministers who were deprived of their, their position for nonconformity actually um, become leaders within the pilgrims. And these are the pilgrims that ultimately voyage to the Americas and land at Plymouth Rock and, 
do Thanksgiving with the Native Americans there, that's those pilgrims. Uh, so this is where the pilgrims come from is right out of here. All right, um, I need to stop here and I will uh, see you in the next video.